Hello, I'm Dale Robbins, the evangelist of the Eubank Church of Christ in Eubank, Kentucky, and today we are continuing our study in the book of Ecclesiastes. As a guide for our study, we have been using Mike Willis's workbook on the book of Ecclesiastes, and today we are in lesson four, looking at chapter four in the book of Ecclesiastes. This is a very, very timely chapter. Solomon here is looking at the things by which vanity is demonstrated, and they plug in perfectly to the day and time in which we now live. In our society, we seem to have some folks who feel as though they are the oppressed. They are the ones taken advantage of. They are the ones who are being overlooked, and they are the ones who are always being cheated and oppressed in some way or another. And then you have the view that there are those at the other end of the spectrum that are the privileged ones, that they are the ones who are blessed beyond measure. They have more than what they have any right to have, and that they should be looked at in somewhat of a capacity of being the enemy because they have been blessed so well and have accomplished so much. And the assumption is that both of these groups are in a a situation where it's somewhat out of their control, that the oppressed are just victims, and the blessed have no issues whatsoever. And Solomon helps us to say that regardless of which end of the spectrum you're on, it's all vanity and vexation of spirit. Let's look at what he says here in verse 1 of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors there was power, but they had no comforter. Hmm, why would they need a comforter? Well, whenever he begins to look at the situation of both of these groups, he points out that the oppressed and the oppressors have their own degree of pain and struggle. We may not believe that. We may see wherever we are on that spectrum that it's all about me and my struggles and my problems and my issues, and I don't identify very well with the strains and the problems that may befall somebody else who is in a different situation rather than mine. But here, here Solomon is talking about the oppressions that are done under the sun. There's plenty enough oppression, and there are disadvantages that go all the way around. And that's why Solomon says it is vanity and vexation of spirit. Let's look at this a little more deeply as we continue. In question two, the author asks, Why are the dead judged to be better than the living? In verse two. That sounds strange. But notice what Solomon says, Wherefore I praise the dead which are already dead more than the living which are yet alive. Hmm. Why would that be the case? Well, as we've noticed, the dead will suffer no more from the oppression of their fellow man. They're not going to be victims anymore. They're not going to carry the, the worry and the strain of this life anymore. And so at that level, and in that respect, Solomon said, at least you get a reprieve from all of these concerns and pressures and oppressions. So he goes on to say in verse 3, Yea, better is he than both they which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. He said, whenever you start looking at the sheer issue of oppression, worry, strain, and concern. Those are things that are going to terminate when you leave this earth. And so in that respect, the dead have an advantage over the living. Now here again, we understand from the scriptures that we could be going on to a wonderful blessedness that would far eclipse any hardships that we have in this life whenever we go home to be with God and enjoy the blessings of heaven. But on the other hand, to the sinful and unprepared, their eternity is even more bleak and is even more disastrous than the minor hardships that they may have had in this life. 
And so whatever our lot may be here in this life, our job is to make the best of it and to make spiritual preparation. But Solomon is not talking about the spiritual preparation aspect of things. He's simply talking about the stress and talking about the oppression and the mistreatments that individuals suffer through as we go through our days here on this earth. In question three, what evil is discussed in verses four through six? He says, again, I considered all travail, that every right work for this a man is envy and of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. The fool foldeth his hands together and eateth his own flesh. Better is a handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. All right, let's, tear, let's unpack this a little bit and see what Solomon is saying here. He says, our earthly endeavors here are short on satisfaction. They are not going to give us that lasting sense of, oh, this is wonderful, I did such a good job, and I am now forever after satisfied. Our earthly endeavors here are going to be of limited benefit. Now, the hard worker is going to experience success. He is going to put his hand to doing the right thing. Now, it's not going to be easy. He said again in verse 4, I considered all travail and every right work. He said, here's the individual who's got his goals. He's got his direction. He's moving forward in the right way. He has a lot of things to be happy about. But notice what that triggers on the part of others. He says, for, for this, a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. This is what we see happening a lot today with the class warfare that we hear talked about in our society. That there are those who have not applied themselves, those who have not yet been successful, and they don't want to go down that road following the past rules of success, of getting a good education, putting forth a lot of hard work and dedication and earning your way to success. They don't want to go down that road. And they resent those who have because they see them as oppressors who are pushing them down and never giving them a chance. That may not be an accurate picture, but nonetheless, it's the thought process of some. But then in contrast to that, Solomon talks about those who are just foolish in their thought process. He says in verse 5, the fool folds his hands together and eats his own flesh. In other words, the fool's miserable. He won't follow the path that could take him to success. He doesn't want to put out the work. He doesn't want to set the goals. He doesn't want to press on for success in this world's affairs. And so he sits back and wrings his hands and is absolutely miserable, blaming his misery on everybody else but himself. And he says here, eating his own flesh. He's eating himself up with the realization, I don't measure up. I'm not successful like all of those other people. So rather than looking at myself and in my own misery and, and why I'm in this condition, I'm just going to be angry and envious of all those people who have gone down a different road. They just were lucky. They, they just got good breaks. That they, they just knew people. And so the fool finds a way to excuse his folly and his lack of effort and to seethe in anger toward those who have gone a different path than the one that he has chosen. In question four, what causes this envy in verse four? Well, the success of the hard worker is the problem. He's put forth the struggle. He's done every right work, it says there in verse four. He's not done anything to be offensive to the fool or to be offensive to the non-motivated. He has kept his nose to the grindstone. He has worked. He has had success. And for his success, he now winds up being hated by others and looked at through envious eyes. In question five, the author says, contrast the man of verse four, that's the hard worker, to the fool of verse five. Well, the successful worker is envied, especially by the fool who does nothing but make himself even more miserable. 
the fool just eats his own flesh, it says. He just finds other ways that are fruitless, other things that are blind alleys that take him to a dead end. He chases one get-rich scheme after another. He makes one bad decision after another. He does not study to develop knowledge and wisdom. He simply emotionally makes snap judgments that often lead him to calamity. As opposed to that, the hard worker puts in the hours. He puts in the travail. He puts in the effort. And as a result of that, he has good works and success. But there are those who will resent him for having what he has. In question six, it says, In what sense is the man of verse four superior to the fool? Well, the hard worker has something to be proud of and has something to supply his needs. That successful worker has goals. He has direction in his life. He doesn't make excuses for, for his failure. He's doing the right stuff. And in contrast to that, the fool is just wasting everything. The opportunities that are given to him. He may even be given a job and here's a chance to make something of himself. But then maybe he has to get up early in the morning or he has to work late hours or it infringes on his social life or, or he can't have access to his technology as much as he wants. And, and so he's willing to flush that job and not even try very hard at it because it's not just being handed to him. Here again. The fool is miserable because he eats his own flesh. He destroys himself. He self-destructs. But the individual who's having some degree of success in this life is working for it in a very determined way. In question 7, the author asks what's discussed in the next verses, verses 7 through 12. Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone and there is not a second. Yea, and he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all of his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches, neither, saith he, for whom do I labor, and bereave my soul of good. This is all vanity, and yea, it is a sore travail. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not yet another to help him up. Kind of reminds me of the commercial of the senior citizen that has fallen and says, I've fallen and I can't get up. We can be in a real plight when we are by ourselves and have such a thing to happen. Again, he says, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, Two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. What Solomon is talking about here is the value of family and of the companionship that results from that. He makes the point here that the riches alone are not going to satisfy. You can become the, the workaholic where there is no end to your labor, but your eye is not going to be satisfied with those riches he says, you're going to maybe even become a bit of a miser. You're so wedded to the money that you won't even allow yourself to enjoy a good time. Neither, saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? Yes, I've got a lot of money. But as the old adage goes, money doesn't buy the happiness. That loneliness is still an issue to face. And that's the point that Solomon is making here. Companionship has benefits at many levels, as he talks about it here. For one, there's a greater sense of accomplishment when you've got someone to share it with. Whenever you have someone to talk to about the successes that you have experienced, and as he says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. They're going to have an extra pair of hands to help an extra set of eyes to look and evaluate and to offer solutions to problems. There's going to be somebody else to offer maybe the physical assistance that you need. Sometimes maybe it's just holding up that board so I can nail the other end of it. But you can accomplish so much more when there is another pair of hands to help. But then as he continues to talk here, 
It also may affect your actual survival. You may fall and need someone to help you to get up or to, to help you if you have been injured so they can seek out the help that you need and help you to survive that calamity. It may be that in taking care of you whenever you are sick, there's someone to, to put on those extra covers when you're running a fever, to, to get you something to drink, to help you to, to keep warm in those times when you're struggling, uh, physically speaking. And then as he mentions in verse 12, it may simply boil down to plain old protection. Having someone who can step into the breach and help you out. You know, whenever someone's wanting to pick on a weak person that they think is not going to be easy pickings, so to speak, they think twice if they're in the company of two or three other people because they may not be able to be victorious against a crowd of two or three others. But if there's just one by himself, then he thinks, well, I can take that person and we wind up being the victim even of some type of violent crime that could wind up in our death. So Solomon is saying here, don't think that being some lone hermit, some miser, somebody who has no one around, that that's going to give you a happy and satisfied life. Because in all of these areas, he's showing it really, really doesn't. And question eight, why is the matter discussed in these verses about companionship going to be the future of the, the man in verse 8. You know, here is the individual, if you look at his future as he describes this guy in verse, in verse 8, he said, There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother. Yet is there no end of all of his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, For whom do I labor, and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity, yea, it is sore travail. He said, look at what happens here. What's going to be your future? You're not going to have anyone to share it with. There's not going to be anyone that you can talk to about your victories and, and about the success of, of your riches. You're going to be lonely and not be able to enjoy that which you've put forth in your efforts. And he says it is vanity and a sore travail. It is that companionship, it is that family that gives purpose to our labors. We're going to have what we need to take care of ourselves and others. And as Paul teaches us in the Ephesian letter, letter we will also have to give to him that needeth. So it's a good course to follow, but we need to have companionship surrounding us to be able to see fulfillment from that labor that we put in. In question nine, he says, why is companionship preferred to solitude? Well, in looking at these verses that we've been reading, without companionship, we achieve less. We're just not as productive without having that extra pair of hands or that extra pair of eyes, that extra set of uh, piece of wisdom to help us solve problems. Also, we are more vulnerable. We are in danger of physical problems. We can fall and be injured with no one to help. We can be sick with no one to care for us. Or we may actually be in physical danger. And so we can deal with, with issues of health and with adversaries who come against us. And when we are by ourselves, we are at a decided disadvantage. And so that solitary life, while sometimes in short spurts, it may seem to be appealing, Solomon is making the point that it's filled with disadvantages. In question 10, he says, To what does the one will lift up his fellow refer in verse 1? Well, whenever you have a companion, you've got someone who can give you physical and psychological support. Someone to talk to, someone to vent to, somebody to, to pick his brain for help whenever it's needed. So for physical and psychological support, we are a benefit to have a companion. In question 11, what evil is discussed in verses 13 through 16? He says, Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. For out of prison he cometh to reign, whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becometh poor. I considered all the living which walk under the sun, with the second child that shall stand up in his stead. The point that is being made here is that we have to understand that the other end of the spectrum 
also has to be considered. You take the individual who now has been affluent. He's the king. He's got power. He's got money. He's got authority. We think that those are the successful people that do not have a care in the world. Solomon says that's not the way it is. Power can corrupt. It can make us get a bad view of ourselves and others. I used to work for a very wealthy family, and rather than being able to enjoy their wealth, most of their conversations were about those individuals who were trying to take advantage of them, those individuals who were trying to get their money, those individuals who wanted them to just shell out money to, to every need and, and to make false investments and to just be taken advantage of. And they had all kinds of worries and fears that what they had was going to be taken away. And then they become, as he continues on in the discussion here, Solomon then begins to talk about that king who becomes old and foolish and will no more be admonished. Well, I've been successful, so I know it all. And no one can tell me anything. When that occurs, an individual sets themselves up for calamity. Because circumstances, Solomon points out here, can change. And we can be replaced. Someone coming out of a prison might be rallied around with supportive personnel who are able to take over the kingdom and you're destroyed. Not able to hold on to what you have. And you may have things riding high and have hot, great investments and have all kinds of financial affluence and then the market crashes, the factory burns or some other issue happens and suddenly you find yourself without anything. There are some individuals on the street as homeless people that once upon a time were very successful but the fate of life went against them they maybe did not listen and see danger coming, and now they completely do without. So things can change, and that's the point that Solomon makes, that the rich are not immune. As the psalmist said, that the, the rich, they have their, their foot in slippery places. They can be up one day, but their destruction can come swiftly and very sure. And so neither the pauper nor the king is immune from oppression and changes in circumstance and from the hardships of this life. And so Solomon keeps saying, it's vanity and vexation of spirit. In question 12, in what respect is, is the kingly office futile? Well, let's say you are the king and you've got all these blessings and you have all this power. It's only temporary. Eventually, you will be replaced. Eventually, you will die. All of this estate, all of this power, it will all go to somebody else. So in this life, we only have today. And who knows what may happen tomorrow and how different things can be. In verse thir or question 13, it says, What will happen to a politician's popularity? That's simply the illustration of what Solomon's talking about here. On the one hand, we can be so popular, we can be so beneficial, everyone respects and appreciates us, and then through maybe lies and deceit and false statements or a mistake on our part, everyone turns against us. And all of a sudden, you're no longer left in office. So we find here the fickle nature of popularity. So Solomon is helping all to see that life is not easy and a bed of roses for anyone. Oppression, worries, and hardship go to completely up and down the spectrum in terms of those things that we've got to contend with. So what is it that he says about all of this? What is to be the, the blessing? He says in there in verse 6, Better is a handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. We don't want to be at the bottom of the ladder, starving and struggling to get by. But neither do we need to be at the top of the heap where we're tearing down our barns to build bigger barns, because that also has with it travail and difficulty. So as the Lord taught us in his prayer, be satisfied with your daily bread. Take care of your necessities and proceed on from there. And living a quiet life 
be happy with the gifts of God that he's bestowed upon you. Looking at the true false, it says, Because of his suffering, Job cursed the day of his birth and wished that he had died. Well, that's true. In Job chapter 3, verses 3 and verse 11. So Job, at the one point, was very wealthy at the outset of the book. Good family and plenty of wealth. But notice how all of that got taken away, and soon he was in the pit of despair, but yet he held on to God. But nonetheless, from an emotional point of view, he wished that he had never been born. Question two. Solomon illustrates the value of friends helping one another by a comparison to the strength of a rope composed of three strands wound together. That's the advantage of companionship and the protection that can be afforded with that threefold cord or an intertwining of friendships. So number two is also true. Number three, the author of Ecclesiastes justifies suicide as proper in those first three verses. No, he doesn't mention suicide at all. He does talk about the oppressions in this life, and he talks about those apply to all, but he does not suggest that suicide is the way out. Yes, we will wind up ending our struggles that we have in this life, but now what happens in eternity, especially if we are unprepared? So Solomon is not an advocate of suicide, so number three is false. Number four, to seek a position of great influence is wrong. Well, that's false, because we can be influential. We are going to be able to help others by being able to, to share the wealth. As Paul told Timothy, charge them that are rich, that they be quick to distribute. We may have some degree of power and influence, and we can use it correctly. So the point is that we, are, we have to understand our wealth here is only temporary, and we need to use it well. So to seek a position of great influence is not inherently wrong, but we have to understand the dangers. It's like Jesus said, it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. It can be done because with God all things are possible, but it will be challenging. And in question five, one of the purposes of marriage is companionship, and that's true. We notice that being implied all through those verses on companionship of having that help meet to help you through your hardships. Here at the bottom, there are a few fill-in-the-blank questions. Number one, Solomon suggests that the basics with satisfaction is more important than abundance. That's what he's talking about in verse 6. Being able to live our lives in quietness and having our needs met is it to be uh, more appreciated and is of greater value than having great abundance. Question two, power frequently accompanies and makes possible oppression. That's what he talks about in verse 1. You can become the oppressor when you have the money and the power to do so. And so oppression frequently accompanies and, get, and puts a person in a position to oppress others because he has the power to do so. In question 3, the king described by Solomon was foolish because he would not accept admonition anymore. He wouldn't take anybody's advice there in verse 13. And in question 4, the incessant desire to, to have more is called, as Solomon sums it up, sore travail in verse 8. When that becomes our fix, fixation, it's all about the money, it's all about the power, it's all about success, it's all about being at the top of the keep, regardless what I have to do to get there, it's just going to be a discouraging fruitless contention on our part to think that at some station in life we can achieve a status where oppression and disadvantage is no longer to be dealt with. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this study in lesson four of our book of Ecclesiastes as we look at Ecclesiastes chapter four, and we hope that you join us next week as we continue our studies. Thank you for joining us today.